Live from KSAT 12, the night beat starts right now. We begin tonight with an update to an hours long standoff in a far west Bear County neighborhood today. Sheriff Javier Salazar tells us a man who was at one point armed with an AR-15 rifle is now in custody tonight. We're told the man surrendered himself to authorities without incident and deputies are now searching his home. Earlier in the day, he'd been seen walking around with the rifle while wearing body armor, even at one point taking what Salazar referred to as a combative stance while facing deputies. My understanding is that we have actually dealt with him within the past couple of months. Uh, he was taken in for mental health evaluation at that point, uh, but it, it appears that since that time he has obtained a, a weapon, uh, a, like, as I mentioned, an AR-15 uh, type rifle. Salazar says that the man was likely suffering from symptoms of PTSD. No injuries were reported. A Universal City family in shock tonight after their loved one was killed in a murder-suicide just over 24 hours ago. Shirts police confirming 45-year-old Kristen Slack died at the hands of her boyfriend. The night team's Jaffney Gray sat down with her family this evening. They shared their memories of the mother of five. Who do you, who can I really trust? I mean, look at how senseless and quick that was. Like her entire family, Susan Doldzner is in pain after learning her sister, 45-year-old Kristen Slack, was killed in a murder-suicide Saturday morning. Church police say Slack was found dead in the yard of a home on Judith Ann Drive. Police say she was shot multiple times by her boyfriend, Todd Danhoff, before he turned the gun on himself. I just started screaming, and I ran up in the room, and I was like, no, what? Oh, my God, what? It, it just doesn't makes sense like what possesses a person to do that 26 year old christian gonzalez is the oldest of five children slack leaves behind it's just terrible because like he took her away from all of her children and i feel like crap just like dealing with it and i can't imagine how my younger siblings feel she loved them so much i mean like so much they say Slack, who was a nurse, was a very charismatic musical woman. She was a very empathetic person, um, very easy to relate to, very a people person. They say she had not been in a relationship with Danoff long, and they say there were no indications of violence. The last times I messaged her, she just seemed happy with him and just only praised him and wanted me to meet him. At this time, the family says they can only take things a day at a time while trying to figure out why. And like I said, I don't think anybody is prepared no. to no, ever hear those words, murder, suicide. Like he said, like it's not real. The family is making funeral arrangements this week. Of course, this situation is still under investigation, but if you or if you know someone who is in a domestic violence situation or has experienced any red flags whatsoever, there's help out there. There's some resources on our website at ksat.com. Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. Taking a look outside tonight with live cam, still cloudy, muggy, and a little warm out there. Temperatures are still in the low 70s, but we've got another round of weather changes right around the corner. In fact, a cold front is about to sneak through San Antonio and Bear County. As far as any rainfall goes, we do have a couple of light showers showing up likely along that frontal boundary just north of Seguin uh, and I-10 there in Guadalupe County up to the northeast. Not a whole lot on radar, but again, I think we are starting to see some shower activity develop along this cold front that is going to drop down south through the area tonight, setting us up for a chilly day tomorrow. We'll have some scattered showers around as well. Now, if you were with us at 530, I mentioned that I was going to be watching this area of South Texas closely out closer to the Rio Grande del Rio to Rock Springs for some potential thunderstorm development. Those storms have been capped to this evening. They have not been able to develop, so that's really going to cut down on our potential for any even isolated severe weather overnight tonight. Nonetheless, we are looking at some scat uh, scattered showers developing tonight through early tomorrow morning. So you'll want to get ready for a somewhat rainy and like I said, very chilly Monday tomorrow. I'll have your full forecast coming up here in just a few minutes.
Thank you, Katie. The winter storm has came and got has came and went and uh, its effects though are still lingering. Some homes on the west side are still without running water tonight, but some residents in that area getting a little bit of help from a group of Californians taking plumbing matters into their own hands. Tonight team's Jonathan Cotto tells us how they're sharing some California love right here in San Antonio. Nunca nos había pasado eso. Westside resident Yolanda Graciela Villarreal's home still without water. She says she and her husband have never been in this situation. Antes más uh, o menos estábamos pues más jóvenes y los dos caminábamos, los dos uh, podíamos hacer las cosas. As she welcomes help, Villarreal says when her and her husband were younger, they could walk, they could take care of things around the house. Quedarse sin agua es un, este, es un suplicio, como le dice uno en México. She says to be without water is torture, but on its way, help. The Texas freeze over inspiring a San Diego coffee shop owner and master plumber to take action. We were basically like everybody else in the country watching the news and uh, saw how crazy it was out here and the freezing temperatures. A combination of shortage in plumbing supplies and residents who can't afford the repair work motivating Chittick and a crew of experts to jump on I-10 straight to San Antonio. We got the skill set, we got the means, we got the, the, the community to raise money for this and let's go out there and try to be a solution to the problem. A problem they helped fix and did it at no cost. As we leave, we know that we've we've made a difference. And thanks to the crew, Villarreal and her husband now have running water after nearly two weeks. She says it was a surprise she wasn't expecting. Es una sorpresa porque yo no esperaba. Tim Courtney, executive director of Micro SA, Diane Sanchez, says this is a wake up call and says there are about 32,000 homes out there that have major infrastructure problems, leaving them vulnerable to future inclement weather conditions. Back to you. Jonathan, we are thankful for those people who came all the way from California. Thank you. New on the night beat, we have now learned the names of two people killed in a crash on the southwest side yesterday afternoon. 32-year-old Amanda Vega and 14-year-old Julissa Bocanegra died after their car collided head-on with the pickup truck in the 12,000 block of Fisher Road. Police say their car veered into oncoming traffic, though it's still unclear why. Two people in the truck were injured and taken to the hospital. We're still working to figure out what condition they are in. Other top stories we've been following today. Arson investigators trying to figure out what started a fire that destroyed a west side garage. That fire was reported just after one o'clock at a home in the 3500 block of Gracie, which is not far from South Sand High School. It was there. Crews say they found a detached garage on fire. They were able to put it out, but it was considered a total loss. The good news, no one was hurt. A driver who authorities say was involved in a hit and run crash last night later died in a separate crash on the east side. The initial hit and run crash happened on North New Braunfels near Highway 90 just before midnight. Police say the driver rear ended another vehicle before driving off. She then stopped on the highway after blowing a tire near General Hudnall. We're told at some point she got out of the vehicle and then was run over by a truck. She was pronounced dead at the scene. Police say the truck driver stopped to help and will not face any charges. A man hospitalized in critical condition after being hit by a car on I-35 last night. The crash happening on the highway between Thousand Oaks Drive and North Wiedner Road. Police say the victim crossed over the guardrail to the shoulder of I-35, eventually running into traffic where police say he was hit by a truck. The victim was thrown from being hit by the vehicle, landing back on the shoulder. The truck driver stopped and called 911 and waited for police to arrive. No charges are expected. Turning now to the latest COVID-19 update for Bear County. Tonight, health officials announced 318 new cases and no new deaths. However, 491 backlogged cases and 150 deaths have now been added to the county's all-time total. In addition, 447 people remain in local hospitals, 195 of them in the ICU, and 11 on ventilators. On the local vaccine front, we want to let you know Metro Health opened 10,000 first vaccine appointments today at the Alamo Dome. Appointments only available for those eligible in phases 1A and 1B and can be made on Metro Health's website or by calling 311. You can find all this information right now on KSAT.com.
And the rollout now of the third authorized vaccine in the battle against COVID-19 is about to get underway. Just this afternoon, the CDC voted to recommend usage of Johnson & Johnson's vaccine for people who are at least 18 years old. Yeah, Johnson & Johnson already expected to begin sending out nearly 4 million doses. ABC's Mary Alice Parks reports. The United States now has a third weapon in the fight against COVID-19. Johnson & Johnson's single-shot vaccine receiving emergency use authorization from the FDA on Saturday. We're confident in our finding that the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine meets our rigorous standards of safety and effectiveness. An independent CDC Council meeting Sunday to review the data, making its public health recommendation. UPS trucks already lined up at this distribution center outside Louisville, ready for the rollout. 3.9 million doses of Johnson & Johnson's vaccine ready to ship out. 2.8 million of those to states and local jurisdictions. The rest to pharmacies, communities, and federally qualified health centers. So this vaccine has been shown to be 100% protective against hospitalizations and death and 85% protective against severe disease uh, for all the variants uh, worldwide. Officials urging Americans to get vaccinated no matter which vaccine is available. We believe that people should take the vaccine that they are able to access. We feel all these vaccines meet our standards for effectiveness. As more Americans get vaccinated and states begin to ease restrictions, Dr. Anthony Fauci says we still need to take some precautions. So you could be protected from disease and still have virus. And that's the reason why you hear us all, all the public health officials saying to wear a mask. And the reason is essentially to protect other people from occasionally you may inadvertently infect someone else, even though you are protected. He says the Biden administration is working with the CDC on updated recommendations for those who are vaccinated. Mary Alice Parks, ABC News, Washington. Still ahead on the night beat, former President Donald Trump re-emerges since leaving office to deliver a keynote address at CPAC. We've got all of the highlights from the big event. Plus, it was a big night for film and television as the winners were announced for this year's delayed Golden Globe ceremony. The winners and some snubs coming up. And up next, a free parenting program aims to help families coping with mounting stress for the pandemic. How experts say the program also prevents domestic violence in our community. We'll be right back. Domestic violence is often triggered by stress factors at home, poverty, job and food instability, lack of child care, all things that have been exacerbated by this pandemic. That's why Metro Health wants people to know about their free positive parenting program, equipping all parents and caregivers with the tools they need to cope with stress. An amazing local mom told me it's changed her life. I have five kids. I have a, a boy at 17, a girl at 16 and have three of the little girls that, that are living with me, a three-year-old, a one-year-old, and a five-month. As if supporting five kids during a pandemic wasn't enough, Margarita Jimenez says her three-year-old daughter, Nia, was diagnosed with stage four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in May. We've been through COVID and she had she had to have stop her, her chemo for a whole two weeks. Even while talking to me on Zoom, she continued her mom duties, getting Nia her snack. She's right here. Hi. Say hi, sunshine. Jimenez found Metro Health's free positive parenting or triple P program about a month ago and immediately took two seminars, the May 90 minute one and another called Raising Confident. How to parent them, how to discipline them, the behavior, self-respect, self-esteem. We know that the way that we're parented, the way that our parents talk to us really kind of becomes the way that we expect other people that love us to talk to us. Jenny Hickson leads Metro Health's Violence Prevention Department and says this program is used successfully all over the world. In communities where they've been able to fully roll out Triple P across the community, there was a meaningful decrease in the number of hospital admissions uh, related to injuries for kids. I mean, to me, it's working well mannered. I every time like she, I wouldn't even have to ask her like now she does it like. Okay, mama, mama, do you need any help, mama? Um, are you okay, mama? Like, if, you know, kids feel those feelings from a parent, you know, and she'll check on me herself. Giving people like Jimenez the ability to enjoy parenting even during the hardest of times. <laughs> Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. 
such a sweet family. We're wishing Nia the best in her treatment. The program is not just for parents. It's for all caregivers. It's free, and you can pick and choose whatever parts you want to participate in. It's also offered in English and in Spanish. To learn more, sign up. We have the specific link you need to click. It'll be on KSAT.com later tonight. Helpful information. Thank you, Courtney. All right, Katie, you've been keeping an eye on a cold front that's moving our way. Still warm yeah. out there, but maybe going to bring us some storms. Uh, yeah, so I, I think we're going to see our temperature drop before anything else. It should maybe happen within this hour uh, and maybe a couple rumbles of thunder tonight. But I think our window to see any storms of much significance is starting to really rapidly close. So if uh, any storms, if that was something that was kind of giving you anxiety tonight before heading to bed, I want you to go to bed and not worry about it because I think what a lot of us are going to see for the most part, just some scattered rain as we head into tomorrow. Uh, rain, not the only thing that will be changing as we start the new work and school week. Our temperatures taking a big dip tomorrow as well. We spent today really all weekend in the 70s, humid with a lot of clouds. Tomorrow the clouds will still be around along with some scattered rain, but it is going to be very chilly out there. Temperatures will not make it out of the 50s tomorrow, even into the afternoon. So get ready to pull that jacket or sweater out in the morning, starting to see a bigger spread in our temperatures at this hour. 50s in parts of the hill country, right at 70 at the airport, uh, mid to upper 70s for some areas well south of Highway 90. So our front is approaching the uh, Highway 90 corridor at this hour. Just looking at our wind direction, still have a southerly wind in Pleasanton, uh, but our wind has started to become northerly here in San Antonio and in New Braunfels. Wind speeds also starting to pick up a bit in New Braunfels. So once this front comes through, north wind settles in. That's going to pull in that cooler air, and we'll also see our wind speeds increase. So it'll become breezy tonight and essentially throughout the day tomorrow. As far as any rainfall goes along the front, not too impressive right now, but we are starting to see a couple of very light returns show up here again generally north of I-10 and Highway 90 there north of Seguin uh, and it looks like we could have maybe a few sprinkles starting to develop in and around New Braunfels maybe just down to the south there but not a whole lot of rain at the moment with this frontal boundary as it drops down into our area. I talked about this a few minutes ago off the top of the show but if you were with us at 530 I mentioned that uh, some forecast models were hinting at some thunderstorm development way to the west out closer to Del Rio and the Rio Grande. If those storms were able to break the cap or the lid that's on the atmosphere out there, uh, they could have become strong to severe. Well, those storms have not been able to develop. It looks like that lid over the atmosphere has held tight. Um, so again, that's why I mentioned that I think our window for any strong to severe storms is really starting to close here very rapidly, but we actually have a couple of things going on. So we have that front that is dropping down through Texas that pulls in the cooler air tomorrow, and I think will help to aid in some scattered showers, but we've also got a little upper level disturbance that's still off to our west tonight. This is going to swing slowly across North Texas as we head into the day tomorrow. So it's going to be the combination of that front and also this upper level disturbance disturbance that will help to produce a scattering of rain tomorrow, mainly during the first part of the day. By this time tomorrow night, a lot of that rain will be starting to move out of Texas and we'll see the sun again by Tuesday. So that's kind of the big picture setup here. Again, front continues to drop south tonight through 2 a.m. Can't roll out again a few rumbles of thunder, but mainly just some showers starting to gradually fill in and then we get to tomorrow morning as that upper level energy moves in from the west. We'll have some scattered light rain around, especially through midday, but I think also lingering a bit into tomorrow afternoon, really starting to come to an end tomorrow night. So technically we do have a low risk of some severe weather in this green area tonight. There were concerns that we could maybe see uh, some small hail and any storms that were able to get going. Again, I think that window is rapidly closing here over the next hour or two, so I'm not concerned about any severe weather overnight tonight. But if you hear a low rumble of thunder or something, uh, don't be alarmed. Again, our severe weather risk fairly minimal tonight. Look at the day tomorrow. It is going to be chilly out there. A big change from this weekend, so go ahead and have a, a jacket with you and an umbrella as well to kind of manage that scattered rain that will be around tomorrow. Guys. I actually have not put my jackets away from <laughs> the store. That was, I don't want to even think about all it. the clothes from all the seasons right at right arm's out. reach. Yes. All right. We'll have a preview of instant replay coming up right after this. 
Tomorrow is back and the Spurs get the win. Let's check in with our Greg Simmons on the big victory and what's more for the shorthanded Spurs. Yeah, and they may be getting another Spurs player out of quarantine as early as tomorrow. And LaMarcus Aldridge comes off the bench for the second straight game coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. And you take a look at DeMar DeRozan. He hasn't played since February 14th. Wow, that's a long time. That's almost as long as uh, I played. <laughs> <laughs> Help has arrived after missing the Spurs' last loss in Oklahoma City due to the death of his father. DeMar DeRozan is back, and with a vengeance, wait to hear what he was able to do in his first game back to help the Spurs beat the Pelicans at home last night. And for the second straight game, LaMarcus Aldridge comes off the bench. The Spurs have three games left before the All-Star break, and they're all at home starting tomorrow night against one of the best teams in the Eastern Conference, the Brooklyn Nets. We'll be missing one of their big stars. We'll get you ready for tomorrow's game with Know Your Foe. Do you feel the necessity of you to even inspire more uh, and bring champion more equality in America? because of what recent events have occurred? Oh, absolutely. It really has just pointed out more of the problems. And we conclude our exclusive four-part series with the Admiral David Robinson tonight as Black History Month comes to a close. Who helped influence him growing up and how can the idea of Carver Academy help shape the future as part of the Black Lives Matter movement? All that plus Canelo and DeZone get a lot of criticism before the fight even began last night. And do you believe LaMarcus Aldridge will play his final season as a spur coming off the bench? Tonight you decide. Instant Replay is live and it's after for the night beat. So far, it looks that way. We'll see. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. Yeah. The night beat continues right after this. Tonight, former President Donald Trump taking center stage. It was his first appearance since leaving office almost 40 days ago. Yeah, he pledged before hundreds of loyalists that he is here to stay. ABC's Trevor Alt reports. Former President Trump receiving a warm welcome Sunday at the Conservative Political Action Conference in Orlando, Florida. We went through a journey like nobody else. There's never been a journey like it. There's never been a journey so successful. We began it together four years ago, and it is far from being over. Today's speech marking his first major address since he left office last month. We are gathered this afternoon to talk about the future of our movement, the future of our party, and the future of our beloved country. Throughout the three-day event, speakers have stood behind the former president, including his economic advisor, Larry Kudlow, who touted Trump's vaccine response. By using government deregulation and private enterprise, private sector genius, generated the most extraordinary medical scientific event probably in American history, and if not so, it'll be in the top three. Trump used Sunday's speech to reassert his influence over the GOP. You know, they kept saying, he's going to start a brand new party. We have the Republican Party. It's going to unite and be stronger than ever before. Republican Senator Rob Portman was asked on ABC's This Week if he thinks Trump's dominance is a blessing or a burden for the party. Well, he's very popular among Republicans, and the polling all shows that. Um, I, I do think that the policies are what's even more popular, and that's why Republicans actually did pretty well in 2020. CPAC, the Conservative Political Action Conference. This year, the conference has been less about traditional conservative values and more about loyalty to Trump. Notably absent were several prominent Republicans, including former Vice President Mike Pence, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, who criticized Trump after the January 6th Capitol riots, and House Republican Conference Chair Liz Cheney, who voted to impeach the now former president. Trevor Alt, ABC News, New York. The White House tonight defending President Biden's decision to not directly sanction Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman for the brutal death of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. This comes after the administration released a declassified intelligence report on Khashoggi's death that said the Crown Prince directly approved of that killing. Today, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said the administration will hold the Saudis accountable, but not with sanctions. We be believe there is more effective ways to uh, make sure this doesn't happen again and to also be able to leave room to work with the Saudis on areas where there is mutual agreement, where there is interest, national interest for the United States. That is what diplomacy looks like. 
Khashoggi is the Saudi journalist who was killed and dismembered at the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, Turkey back in 2018. Saudi Arabia's uh, foreign ministry called the U.S. intelligence report on his death false, an unacceptable assessment. Meanwhile, in the U.K., more than 230,000 people have signed an online petition urging the government not to introduce what's being called a vaccine passport, which would essentially require proof of vaccination for travel. The petition states, quote, such passports could be used to restrict the rights of people who have refused a COVID-19 vaccine, which would be unacceptable, end quote. Prime Minister Boris Johnson said on Tuesday that the UK would review scientific and ethical questions surrounding the use of those passports. Any petition that surpasses 100,000 signatures must be considered for debate in the House of Commons second chamber. For the past several years, there's been a battle brewing over how the Alamo's history is told, from criticism that the story of the 1836 battle has been distorted by myths to those who want to shine a light on what happened at the mission prior to the Texas Revolution. It is the topic of this week's episode of KSAT Explains. Myra Arthur has a preview. It is one of the most well-known historic sites in the United States, and it's located in the heart of downtown San Antonio, the Alamo. The Spanish mission was built more than 100 years before the start of the Texas Revolution, but it's perhaps best known for the battle that happened on its grounds in 1836. The Alamo has been depicted in film and television for more than 100 years. The movies make it bigger than life. But recently, headlines about the Alamo have focused on the controversy over plans for its future, and the topic has become a political lightning rod, raising questions about whose stories are prioritized and how when talking about the past. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Keep it how it is. Just a few phrases shouted out by angry people today listening to a presentation about changing the layout of Alamo Plaza. The Tempilan Pualhuiltecan Nation filed against the Texas General Land Office, Alamo Trust, and the city of San Antonio. Tempilan believes the Alamo site is a cemetery where American Indians are buried, so it should be officially recognized as such. In this week's episode of KSAT Explains, we're talking about the history and the legacy of the Alamo, as as well as the battle over how the historic mission is remembered. Well, it was a warm but very cloudy weekend. If you got to see a little bit of sunshine, consider yourself lucky because that cloud cover was persistent out there. Nonetheless, it got quite warm again today. High temperatures in the 70s in the 80s, 86 in Laredo this afternoon, 83 in Pleasanton. We were stuck in the mid 70s here in San Antonio and obviously plenty of humidity to go along with that warmth. But changes, they are knocking on our back door at this hour. A front is moving through. It will be moving through San Antonio within the next hour or so. And this does have some cooler air behind it. Uh, so get ready for some big changes heading into the day tomorrow. Yes, we could be looking at some rain, but what will really get your attention, the drop in temperatures heading into Monday, will be stuck in the 50s even into Monday afternoon. So have that jacket or sweater handy. We'll talk more about what you can expect rainfall wise tonight and into Monday coming up in just a bit. Courtney. Thank you, Katie. Well, the results are in. Highlights from tonight's Golden Globe ceremony after the break. It was a glitzy night in Hollywood with the 78th annual Golden Globe Awards wrapping up just a short time ago. ABC's Rena Roy shows us the big moments and big wins. Like so much over the past year, the Golden Globes were unlike they've ever been before. Welcome to the 2021 Golden Globe Awards. Amy Poehler and Tina Fey hosting together for the fourth time, but this time... Now, Tina and I are hosting from two different cities tonight. You won't even notice. The first award of the night... And the Golden Globe goes to... Daniel Kaluuya for his role in Judas and the Black Messiah. You do me die, I'm on. Is, Nominees appearing on. virtually this year, which of course meant a few hiccups. As you can see, we unfortunately have a bad connection. Presenters live in Los Angeles before a socially distanced audience of frontline workers. Josh O'Connor, the crown. Netflix is the crown taking home multiple awards, including best drama series. The crown. 
The Hollywood Foreign Press Association has been criticized for a lack of diversity. My friend is stressed. None of its members are black, according to the Los Angeles Times, and critics say HBO's acclaimed series, I May Destroy You, which features a predominantly black cast, was snubbed entirely. Everybody is understandably upset at the HFPA and their choices. A number of black actors and black-led projects were overlooked. The organization says it's working to improve diversity. We recognize we have our own work Work to do. Just like in film and television, black representation is vital. We must also ensure everyone from all underrepresented communities gets a seat at our table. And we are going to make that happen. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. Congratulations to Courtney and producer Alex for guessing all of them right tonight. And not even having seen half the movie. <laughs> In the aftermath of those winter storms earlier this month, many of us are now seeing the damage done to our yards and gardens. Up next, some advice on how to salvage what's left. Well, a lot of us had more pressing issues to deal with during last week's winter storm. We are just now starting to see the toll those record temperatures had, especially when it comes to our lawns and landscaping. Yeah, I haven't even started with that. Even yeah. if you wrapped some of your more vulnerable plants, it may not have been enough considering the magnitude and the duration of the freeze. Our Justin Horn gives us some insight on what to do next when it comes to your flower beds. What may have been green two weeks ago is now likely brown and appearing lifeless. It's a mess, horticulturally speaking, in and around Bear County. So what's next? Is it all a total loss? Maybe not. So what we need to do is get some real sharp pruners, get some quality hand pruners, head shears, quality loppers, and in about a week or no more than two weeks, start cutting, cutting, stripping leaves, cutting. Uh, cutting to the green wood on a lot of the um, perennials. That goes for evergreen shrubs too. Pull the organic mulch away to allow the late February sun to warm up the soil. Meantime, other plants like palms and sago palms took a beating too. Wait a couple weeks on those, completely remove all the dead looking fronds. And as long as their center is nice and firm, then you might be okay. The new fronds will emerge from the center. If the yellow crown is soft and removes easily, it likely didn't make it. And another group you'll need to be patient with. Citrus, there's a ton of citrus that looks very, very bad. And on the citrus, we, re re we really have to be a little bit more patient with citrus as well. In fact, patience is the key in general. If you don't see vigorous, healthy growth by mid-April, early May, uh, then I, and or they look lacking and they're real slow coming out or they're real just weak, then you would probably want to replace them. Also keep in mind that while we are approaching our average last freeze here in San Antonio, a freeze in March is always possible. Justin Horn, KSAT 12 News. I was looking out the window before I came to work today. Just so depressing looking back there. Everything is like that color of brown now. Yeah. And you like that Thursday before all this happened, it was in the 80s and everything was blooming. And Yeah, I have plants that so I gross. have no idea how to take care of. Even after Justin's very helpful story, I'm feeling a lot of anxiety about it. So you're not alone. <laughs> I know. We're all in this together. I'm one of many. We're all in this together. So many oh, questions still to be answered. Yeah. I, we may all learn a lot about plants. Yeah. Maybe I'll get that green thumb this year. There you go. <laughs> um, I think so. Over the past couple of days, we've been talking about the possibility of some rain, maybe even some storms tonight into tomorrow. If you've been with us this newscast, you know that I've been saying our window to see any severe weather is rapidly closing. I think it's pretty much closed at this point. Now, I can't roll out some rumbles of thunder tonight at times, but not concerned with widespread severe weather. So if that was kind of giving you anxiety tonight before you had went to bed, um, don't want you to have any anxiety. Now tomorrow will be a chilly day. So if you're not a fan of the cold, um, tomorrow's gonna be a lot cooler than what we saw this weekend. But important to note here, no freeze tomorrow morning, tomorrow night, or at all this week. But it will be significantly cooler tomorrow than it was this weekend. So in the morning, upper 40s near 50 degrees, but only warming into the mid 50s by tomorrow afternoon with some scattered light rain around. And these changes are because uh, partially because of a cold front that's moving through as we speak. 50s in Waco, 53 in Dallas, some 40s uh, up closer to the Concho Valley. We've got some 50s dropping in now to a portion of the hill country, so temperatures have been falling from Fredericksburg down to Kerrville. Still holding steady at the airport, but I think 
within the next half hour. We're going to start to see that temperature at the airport fall into the mid to upper 60, 73 in Pleasanton, so still quite warm well to the south of 90. So that front is working in now. We've got a nice north wind here in San Antonio at about 13 miles per hour, also turning breezy up in New Braunfels. So once this front moves through, our temperatures will start to drop, but wind speeds increase, so it will turn breezy tonight and stay that way all day tomorrow. In fact, I'm just going to call it windy tomorrow because we're going to keep our wind gusts on Monday beginning overnight tonight. 3 a.m. Uh, our wind gusts up near 30 35 miles per hour, essentially through midday tomorrow. They'll drop down a bit in the afternoon, but it's going to stay gusty at times all the way through the day on Monday. Pair that with temperatures just in the 50s and yeah, it's going to be a chilly day tomorrow. So front is working in now. I believe we can see it here on radar. Yeah, there it is. That green line showing up. That's the front moving through. It is starting to produce a couple of showers in the northern portion of Bear County inside 1604 over near Live Oak. Uh, they're closer to the 281 corridor between 281 and 35. So some very light showers are developing, but it looks like the front is right there just south of Seguin. And again, this boundary is going to continue to drop south tonight. Temperatures falling, things turning breezy. Now, as the front continues to move through, I do think we'll start to see a gradual increase in some light shower activity uh, with this rain becoming more scattered as we get closer to dawn tomorrow morning. And again, I can't rule out a rumble of thunder here or there, but again, not concerned with severe weather. But the commute tomorrow morning certainly could be unpleasant at times with this light rain around and with a passing disturbance moving overhead tomorrow, we're going to keep scattered rain in the forecast all the way essentially through Monday afternoon with rain chances starting to taper off Monday evening. Tomorrow night will clear out and we'll get some good sunshine going for you on Tuesday finally, but tomorrow much cooler day, some scattered light rain, especially through the first part of the day, and then I'll we'll start to taper off in the afternoon, but keep your jacket or sweater with you because we will not be warming up tomorrow. We will warm up by the middle of the week back to mostly sunny skies and 70 on Wednesday guys. Ooh, Wednesday and Thursday look so pretty. Look forward to those. Yeah. <laughs> We'll be back with a look at the uh, weekend box office right after this. You're not safe here. Let's go. The Marksman stayed in fifth place, rounding up $700,000. You can save the world. In fourth place, Wonder Woman 1984 made $710,000. Why is that? Why is that? The Little Things fell to third place on ticket sales of $925,000. Isn't it strange how this food grows in perfectly straight? <laughs> the Crudes, A New Age, lost the top spot, but $1.2 million gave the animated sequel second place and a domestic total of $52 million. I will not let this hotel be ruined by a cat and a mouse. Tom and Jerry clobbered the competition. The big screen adventure of TV's cat and mouse duo debuted with $13.7 million, the biggest opening weekend since Wonder Woman 1984 premiered with $16.7 million back in December. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. A lot of parents suffered through that one for their kids this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> the entire NCAA women's basketball tournament is getting ready to head to San Antonio in just a few weeks in San Antonio sports asking for your help. And now that we're in the playoffs, we will update the girls and boys basketball postseason schedule that had to be altered due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Let's find out what else is on instant replay tonight with Greg Simmons. And remember, they're all going to wind up here, hopefully, at the state tournament in the Alamo Dome. And the University of Dean Carter where it finally gets to play football and they score a huge win on the road. Coming up tonight on a brand new edition of instant replay. They're excited. I'm happy for them to finally get out there and get the opportunity. We've had to watch a lot of football games this year. Anywhere, everywhere. We'll, we'll play anybody anywhere. After having their home opener canceled, the Cardinals of UIW finally got to play some football after the pandemic delayed their season to the spring. And they responded with a resounding road win over McNeese, coached by former UTSA head coach Frank Wilson. And Canelo Alvarez with a quick win in the ring for his next fight right after Cinco de Mayo. And as we've been working side by side with the NCAA, just trying to determine the format of the event, what the entire thing looks like, the testing protocols and every, everything else, we just now have determined what our volunteer needs will look like. 
The women's entire NCAA basketball tournament will be staged right here in San Antonio and the surrounding area in just a matter of weeks. And how you can help San Antonio sports tonight with this unprecedented event. And our Larry Ramirez will have the complete girls and boys basketball playoff schedule in high school. Who's left in the fight for the state tournaments here in San Antonio? And is it time for the Houston Texans to finally bite the bullet and trade Deshaun Watson after what happened in his first meeting with his new head coach? The sports guys are back tonight to decide. Instant replay is live and it is next. That situation not getting any better. That drama just builds. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. You got it. We'll be right back.